Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so yesterday we witnessed what may go down in history as a landmark case. Derek Chauvin has been found guilty on all counts for the murder of George Floyd. We're here today to discuss the impact of this verdict and what its implications will be moving forward. We have a formidable lineup of panelists today. So without much further ado, I'll just jump in with the introductions. First off, I'll proceed with introducing Katrina, Sister Katrina Hassan Hamilton. She's with the Muslim Journal and is a member of MPAC's African-American Muslim Insight Council. She has over 20 plus years of experience serving students and families in education and strongly advocates for equity and social justice in schools. Currently, Katrina is the co-chair of Black Minds Matter Advocacy Group of San Diego, founder of United States Black and Brown, and she's completing her doctorate in education policy and organization leadership at the University of Illinois at Urbana campaign with a concentration in diversity and equity. Sister Katrina, thank you so much for joining us. Brother Umar, um, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Umar Hakim Day is the founder of Encourage and chair of MPAC's African-American Muslim Insight Council, a native of the city of Compton, he serves as a consulting director of ILM Foundation. After 13 years in telecommunications, Umar shifted his focus to becoming an entrepreneur, which opened him to social and community service work. He earned a business management degree from the University of Phoenix and a master's degree in ethical leadership from Claremont Lincoln. Thank you so much. Ario Khalif is the executive director um, yes. of Voices of African Women. VAW and vice president of the Minnesota Dakota State NAACP. And she is the former president of St. Paul NAACP. A passionate advocate for East African women and girls, she founded the first shelter in the United States for East African and Muslim women who experience homelessness or domestic and sexual assault. She, an, she is an activist who addresses violence against women, Islamophobia, hate crimes, and the need for equity and inclusion, and is a 2020 Bush Foundation Fellow recipient. Welcome, Fario. Thank you so much for joining us. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Mashallah, I'm glad to be here today and to join you in this struggle that we all going through are here in our own state here in Minnesota, and I'm grateful to be part of this discussion today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We're grateful for having you. And finally, we have Salam, who is the president and co-founder of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. So the first question that I have is, many are calling yesterday's verdict historic and have hailed the decision as justice served. Others are framing it as a win for accountability, not necessarily justice. Where do you stand in this debate? Or do you propose a different lens altogether? Thank you, Sister Prima, for that um, that question. Uh, it's a loaded question. And so I guess for me and for others like me, it is, there's a balance, right? There's a balance. It's, of course, a victory in knowing that uh, a guilty verdict on all accounts was, you know, achieved. The, the jury, we need to thank them. All praise is due to God because, you know, it just took them 10 hours to deliberate. But quite honestly, if it weren't for 17-year-old Darnella Frazier, uh, we don't know what the outcome would have been. You know, um, many of us, I know those who have listened to me before, they will hear me say over and over, we have gone through racial trauma, we have gone through racial battle fatigue, we're exhausted. Most of us believe that, you know, we were numb and we just didn't know what to expect. Others were anxious. Most of us really thought that there was going to be, you know, yet another verdict like so many of our other tragic young men and uh, women who have been murdered, in particular our men. And, you know, they just thought, okay, it's just going to be another not guilty. But quite honestly, that first day, the prosecution, and thank you, AG, Brother Keith Ellison, may Allah reward you for your leadership. That video said it all. Prosecution really didn't have to say much, but they did a good job. The witnesses spoke, but it was that video, the courage of that young woman in that 10 minutes that showed that he was killed, George Floyd, in real time. That 
as Brother Umar will say, set a precedent. It set a precedent for future cases. We currently, and Sister Farheel, Sister Farheel, inshallah, will talk about it more. We have a young brother by the name of Dalal Eid. His case still needs to receive justice. His parents are waiting. It's sitting in the hands of the Dakota County's prosecutor's office. And the prosecuting attorney, he actually just retired. So, and I hope inshallah when Brother Jelani comes on, he can talk more about it. We have so many cases. So this is not, it's a victory. We have to wait for the sentencing, but it's a start for us to move forward. So with that, I'll turn it back to my other panelists. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's 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 a victory and it's a start. That's a great way to, to frame it. Um, Sister Fario, I, I will give you the same question as well. I'm, I'm really keen to see what your insight is. Oh, I agree. Um, my sister, I believe what's happening is, is, is happening, right? Um, was You don't usually see black men is being killed by the white man and usually the white man never get convicted. And this is not only behind the scene or the small cases, but it's a, a wider a, around the world, this case we've been watching. If you walk around here on Lake Street in our communities, and every day when I live here at the office and you, you see the troops on the streets every corner, you feel like in a war zone, really. And the officers, not the officers, the military guys and women who are doing they basically doing their job. But for us, just to witness what we saw yesterday was relief for our communities. It was relief and we were not sure what to expect. Really, we didn't believe that this is uh, capable of a white man who killed the black man in the daylight will be something we can just easily wait and this verdict will come out and found guilty. Um, I think justice, what does that mean? Is this just a little piece of, you know, this is something that gives people the hope, but this is just the beginning. This is the beginning was possible. This is beginning was possible not here in Minneapolis and our communities, but around the country. There was a right Right. There, were, there was another killing and another shooting in Ohio. Then there was another one. There was another one. And there's many more. We haven't even heard it as of we're speaking right now. So I think um, what um, really took place yesterday, it was emotional. We are grateful, gratitude to the communities, the activists who unstoppably they never stopped believing this justice must happen because the forces that we come together, when humanity, people show up the way they did for the last eight, nine months, continuing and chanting, if it's not justice, they know it's not gonna be peace. So I see many communities of color join, no matter where you are. But you know the white supremacy in this country? where it comes to, look, look at me, I'm a black woman, but I'm an immigrant also, but also I'm a Muslim, right? And so what, if it feels like, you know, you must wake up every morning and fight the fight and be on the table. Like, right, tomorrow I'm leading a discussion about the DOJ, they're coming in town because they just announced that they're gonna be doing investigation, the forces that they use in Minneapolis Police Department. So I'm glad that, we're having a discussion, the table we're going to be doing tomorrow from 6 to 8 p.m. The DOJ, the U.S. Attorney Office, and everybody's going to be on the table. We are telling them we have to make sure our voices is heard through not only you, when something like that happens, you go to that white community or organizations. Now we have a lot of communities just look like me, who's a Muslim, who's Blacks, but who cares about their communities? Are we on the ground every day fighting the fight? And so what happened yesterday was just the beginning of a little bit victory celebration, but the struggle, the struggles, the black communities in the United States is still continues. Yeah, that's very, very powerful. And I, Pretty much as the, as the case, the verdict came out, that's as soon as that came out, we heard about the Ohio shooting. We heard about Makia Bryant. And that that takes me into my next question. Um, 
will this case in fact set precedent for future cases of police brutality? Where do you see this having the most impact? Um, on that question, I'll start with Brother Umar. Um, um, will this case set precedents for others to, to, to follow? Um, this reminds me of something that El Hajj uh, Malik said, Malcolm X. He said that there was a knife in the African American's back. So right now, the knife has been acknowledged. It's still in there. It's still in there, but the knife has been acknowledged that we do have a knife in our back and we need to start slowly working with others to pull this knife that's been, that's been in our back for over 400 years since 1619 in this country. Mm -hmm. been, uh, like my sister said, the trauma that we've been, um, that we've been um, uh, oppressed under. My first taste of racism was in school, actually, in the school books. I had a problem with did come up because my family's from South America. So by, and I connected those images to those, to, to my family members, like I didn't want to deal with them because they show savages. So my, my introduction to racism first in this country was in school, McGraw Hill books or whoever uh, makes those books. So will this be president for other cases? Yes, I hope so. I think so. Because what I feel, in my opinion, were retaliation shootings after the verdict went down. You know what I'm saying? They had, they had to get somebody to still prove that point. Identifies that there is a rooted problem in law enforcement. I'm not going to blanket all of law enforcement, but there are individuals who have a serious ill in their heart some type of God complex where they think they could just rip life from one of the sons and daughters of Adam. So, you know, um, in the Quran, it tells us to save a life is to like save all of humanity, but to kill a life is to kill all of humanity. So, yes, I do think that this sets a precedence for future cases to come, but we still have some of that knife to pull out of our back inch by inch. And now that I feel that we have more allies, um, there's hope for belonging more here. Thank you. Brother Umar. Um, and again, this is an open discussion. So um, Salam, Sister Katrina, Sister Fario, if at any point you would like to jump in, um, please feel free to do so. Salam, um, I haven't gotten to you yet, so I would pose the same question to you as well. Yes, um, I think that um, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I don't think we need to add any more in, in, in terms of uh, what's been stated already. Um, the, the two areas that I think we need to be looking at um, are the, you know, the first is how do we institutionalize this so that we prevent these situations from happening. Um, and that requires uh, legislation. Now is the time for legislation on this. Now is the time to demand accountability uh, for all law enforcement, what MPAC calls constitutional policing. We need constitutional policing where there's a pledge that um, each police officer is bound by the constitution. Is, and as we stated in our statement yesterday, a police officer cannot be the judge and the jury and the executioner. That's been the problem. So there, there needs to be uh, focus now in the legislative arena. Number two, law enforcement or police brutality is one manifestation of this problem. The, the oppression that is happening is systemic. And so we have to look at the nerve centers of our own country and deal with that. And that means our media, that means Hollywood, that means uh, Washington DC, that means uh, even our schools and the racism still in our textbooks. 
that is happening. So this this is an all out effort. And you know, I'm hearing from Muslims, well, you know, what about anti-Muslim hate? I think now if you can't separate if you, if you're going to separate anti-black hate with anti-Muslim hate, you've lost the message. Okay. We have to work on this issue, and then that will take care uh, of uh, all, all people, including uh, all Muslims, inshallah. Um, Sister Katrina, I see you've unmuted yourself. Oh, no, I mean, alhamdulillah, what was said was amazing, and it's true. And as an educator, you know, that's, I don't want to see that's my thing, but, you know, again, police officers and, you know, judges, lawyers, you know, look at Siobhan's um, defense attorney trying to criminalize George Floyd, you know, in his death. It was appalling to watch. And I kept thinking to myself, if we had defense attorneys like that in our neighborhoods, you know, with all the brothers who are, you know, wrongfully accused of petty crimes, we would have a lot of young men at home right now. So, it was just amazing to see how he could still, you know, I guess he had to do his job, but it was just appalling to see. But going back to schools, you know, the policing that you see on the streets, unfortunately, that same type of policing happens in schools across our nation, you know, in the form of school policing. Some districts even contract with police departments, you know, depending on the neighborhoods. So while in Los Angeles Unified School District, they have done an amazing job to defund, you work with the school board to defund the school police and to take that money to hire 35 counselors to work specifically with African-American youth in LAUSD high schools. There's still a lot of work to be done. I mean, I know most of us on this call have seen children as young as six years old being handcuffed saying, you know, I'm sorry, I promised this little baby, African-American baby saying, I promise I'll be good, you know? And so the vast majority of our officers, we have good officers, but we have to look at, again, the systemic racism that happens in schools because children live what they learn and they become adults. So until we correct the, the textbooks, but not just the textbooks, we have to understand the biases that comes with teachers. You know, right now in the United States, 79% of our teachers in public schools are white, female, and middle class. Does that mean all white women are terrible? No. But when we look at statistics and we look at the amount of suspensions and expulsions that are happening in schools today, African-American males are disproportionately suspended and expelled more so or higher than any other subgroup. And then our young women, you've heard me say this before, our young women, they outpace all girls and they even outpace white, Latinx and um, Asian males or boys. The only other groups that they kind of, you know, you know, don't outpace are biracial students where they tie with our indigenous or native American males. And of course our black boys. So this is a problem. It's a problem that we have to really eradicate. And until we fix what's happening in schools, we're gonna to continue to have this problem because when we push our kids out of classes, we are basically funneling them into our uh, prison systems. And it's kind of like they're going from the seat to the cell and we have to stop this. Yeah, um, just today I attended a, um, a press conference for the Los Angeles, let me see, what's the Los Angeles Peace Builders Coalition, headed, uh, led by Akil Bashir and Khalid Shaw. And they are, they have been doing prevention work on the ground for years. But today they announced their intentions that they, as first responders to the crimes in the streets, whether it's internal or external, law enforcement or not, they are seeking to be, uh, to, uh, to be funded for being first responders in this in this work. So the main conversation is community policing ourselves, do for self. So this group has been doing it for years. I could go down the list of the organizations that participated in some of the work I was trained in, but this work is very important for communities to start learning how to police ourselves 
and how to uh, create these professional relationships with law enforcement too as they come check with us when they come into our communities. It's a must because our human security is just as valuable as anybody other's uh, sustainability in this country. So, you know, um, our human security is very important and we must take control of our narrative and own in that whole situation and not leave it to nobody else to say, hey, I'm gonna come secure your neighborhood for you. No, we gotta do it ourselves. You on mute, Mom? All right, I, I would go further and say that our human security um, and that is the security of civilian populations, not the security of the national security state, the apparatus, the, uh, the intelligence agencies, the, um, uh, the various uh, um, homeland security um, entities and so on and so forth, the CIA, the FBI. I would say that our human security, the security of civilian populations is more critical than that type of security. We will not have real security without human security. You know, um, I believe this impact, it will continue. Um, and what you see, George Floyd was more like unique case because the world had to be still to witness that. It was a COVID, everybody was at home and everybody was just watching they, in front of their camera and watching anything that they can do. Because if there was a Philando Castile several years before that, few block, few miles from where that took place here, 38 right here, where I'm at right now, few miles away from here where George was killed. But Philando Castile, you be like 10 minute drive from here. He, he was killed in daylight. It was alive and Facebook and the whole world had to watch. But did he get any um, justice the way this time? Maybe not, because the guy was found not guilty and he was released. Maybe he found a job somewhere else, another state he moved to, who knows? I think this will not gonna change how the white supremacy within the police departments, they always say, okay, there's a, yeah, there's always a good officers in there. But what about the officers who are always love to go and kill black men and black women out there, or maybe immigrants who are really trying to have a better life because they left for different countries, right? The trauma that took place because of the whole world, our country, our state, our community was dealing with pandemic COVID-19. And then we have to deal with this. This is what's not black and white. This is what's like human being was being killed and lunch the daylight. This is usually took place when the black man has been killed the way they did many, many. This will be say, oh, this was like 100 years ago. No, this is happening today in our communities. Why should the case like um, and, and that took place in Brooklyn Center uh, a couple of weeks back? And they say the case was she was, um, it was an accident and she was supposed to be grabbing her taser instead of her gun. But look at the case of Mahmoud Noor, Mahmoud Noor. He was a similar. He, he said it was an accidental, the way he, he fired that gun, but they rushed to, what did they do? They rushed to put him in jail and then not only he, and then sending him to, um, in, in jail for 10 to 12 years, but also giving her family $20 million, short, just like that. But also guess what? She had a, a white country, Australia, Australia, was backing her up, was in here in the United States, making sure this black man who killed this white woman goes to jail. And not only that, she also be rewarded a heavy amount of dollars. But l l let's reverse back a little bit, go back. Look at it, Philando Castile, the same attorney who settled for her $20 million for her family, settled for Valerie Castile, Philando's Castile family for $3 million. So they basically wrapped him for that family, what, $17 million. This was not just as done. And they told her, she's not gonna, how old are you, 60 years old? You're a black woman, you're not gonna live to 65 years. You better grab this $3 million and run. But the same attorney turned around two years later and settlement due for $20 million for different community, but she this time is a white family. 
So if you see this impact that happening right now, that you think is gonna stop because of what took place yesterday, like I said earlier, the struggle continues. It's not gonna change. Black man is gonna be killed daylight by the police, by others, and then they're gonna get away with it. And because of the forces, that you, the whole world come together. In this case, because of the COVID-19, everybody had witnessed this and they said, and the white man, the white woman knew about, this man was already guilty, but it was all the time, the black community, the immigrant, the Muslim community, have to come forward and fight for justice and to see this, it could happen. And we were all surprised, but the white community was not surprised. They knew he was guilty from day one, but they were gonna see how we're gonna fight for that. But I'm just so grateful the activists, the community leaders, community members and advocates, everybody to never stop fighting for this fight, for this justice. So I say it will not change anything, but it just changes for that today. But I think we shall must be continuing the fight. Our forces must be fighter and more bigger. And, and I think the more we do what we're doing right now and we don't sleep on it and we don't get back to sleep, I think it's, it's doable. Yeah. Um, that's, that's I, I hear you, I, I, I really hear you. I know here in Los Angeles, we are under the protocol to where we secure our own selves. We, 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 um, we, um, we, our neighborhoods, our mosques, we take, we take lead on that front. And today was an example of saying enough is enough, no more. One of the things that I do like what happened um, on the prosecution side was the jury. The jury was definitely more open-minded. I think right now we have more allies than we think that we have to fight this fight going forward. You know, we just now have to tap into this energy and and um, and start more organizing because power is in the product of the relationships that we create. And now that I feel that we have more um, allies, we need to identify who these people are so we can bring them to the table because it, it's not just us that's suffering or being uh, targeted because I want this to stop before it hits another person's community. I want this to stop before it kills little Johnny or, 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 or little Susie or even um, little Oko, whoever. We have a duty and a responsibility to take lead in this and own our narrative of who we are in this country and what we've been meant to. Now, and, I do, and I do believe that it's gonna change. Is it gonna to change tomorrow? Maybe not, but as long as the people on this screen and the audience that's watching band together to be that one unit, we can make a difference real, um, at least in our lifetime when it comes to policy, legislation, and, um, and getting our own people in office. I think that's key too. And I, I do wanna say when we go back to you know the change, you know, Sister Barrio, I'm so glad you mentioned our beloved brother who, you know, who was an officer. And, you know, in no way are we justifying, you know, the shooting. But when you're looking at that case, this brother was, you know, on duty. It was dark. There were so many reasons for him as an officer to be fearful of his life and his partner's life, yet he was convicted. So the one good thing alhamdulillah that happened not the one good thing but one of the additional things that we have not discussed yet that has happened in the Chauvin's verdict is that it sets a precedence for future officers who do the same thing now we have something to fall back on we can say look this is what happened look at this case and lawyers will be able to fight for families more so than they have before and we understand that there is, I mean, we can't even count the amounts, amounts of young men in particular who have been murdered. Look at Dante Wright. I mean, it's just amazing how it continues to happen right down the street or not too far from where George Floyd was murdered. And again, I go back to Dalal. I can't help but keep going back to this young Muslim Somali black child or, or young adult. You know, and again, people are going to say, well, he fired at the officers. He did this. He did that. But let's look at the case. We have we have incidents where white males 
shoot at officers and they get arrested. Like they, they just walk away and they get, you know, sent to mental health institutions, you know, but our young men are always, are constantly murdered, you know? So we have to look at that as a victory. There are so many victories, you know, and I know we have to wait for the sentence in eight weeks, but there's so many victories that we should be applauding and looking at you know, as a result of this one particular case. Well, this systematic racism in this country did not just show up yesterday. It's been in place for 100 years through the black communities and now all communities, African immigrants are more than ever um, showing up and fighting for justice because we are in America. Just the white man, we tell him, you don't belong to this country. Just like you telling us we don't belong to here. The native is belong to this country. You're the white man. You go back to Europe where you come from. This is the land that from the natives. So we are an immigrant. We might be the new immigrants. But we're going to challenge you every little thing that we can get. Because you know what? If you want to run for office, we're going to run right next to you. And we're going to win. And we're going to keep recruiting more blacks and Muslims. And, and I think it's, it's, it's the way that we have to unite. Our communities have to come together. The African American, the African American, African immigrant communities, we all have to come together. We, the immigrant communities, we all have to come together. The, the, and the, for us to do that, for me, joining the NAACP eight years ago, it was my hunger. I want to know and how I want, I want to be part of my brothers and sisters, this community that who looks like me, who's part of me, who are originally the African descents of the slaves in this country. And I'm so grateful. You know what? If we come together as a black communities, as a Africans, as a Muslim communities, as a Asian communities, as a Latino communities, we will have so much um, to talk to, I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of calls from, I'm, I'm hosting tomorrow an event. You know what, my sister, I told you, um, what happened to Mr. Wrights and the way they killed him and they was gonna call and it was an incident and all of that, you know what, that's a, I don't want to use the word, that's, that's not true. I think she, she has to face the way Mahmoud Nur was faced and she has to be found um, accountable. And I think our great, wonderful attorney general here, Keith Ellison, he's, I'm sure he's going to be on top of that. Um, that's, not, that's just one case, there's many more that we're not talking about. There's many more are here that we are really um, struggling. How can we we face all of this trauma in our community. But you know what, today for this particular Zoom meeting, because of what took place yesterday, because of our little victory that we need to celebrate, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a need healing. It's a time for healing. Time for us to talk about what's possible to empower our community and say, you can do this. We can unite and we can build the unity for community to, for us to come to heal each other. This systematic racism it did not show up yesterday and it's not gonna end today. It's us collectively coming together and be pressuring the pressure, the forces that we have. I think we can go far, but I, I believe it's just the beginning, a long way to go. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, emphasize that point that this is a multi-generational struggle. Uh, this struggle will continue beyond our lifetimes. Uh, and that's very, actually, when you look at the stories, since we're reading the Quran this month of Ramadan, and you read the story of the prophets, they all worked for something, the fruit of which uh, was not born until after their lives. Uh, look at Abraham, uh, alayhi salam. He built the Kaaba with just uh, himself, his son, and his wife, and now millions of people uh, go to the Kaaba. Look at Isa, alayhi salam and just the few disciples that he had around him. Moses, uh, alayhi salam, uh, was told to wait in the desert uh, and end the mission there. So we, we do what we can do, but we have to understand that part of the equation is the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and, and, and that will give us patience, not patience in a passive way, but patience in a way that we work and we work and then we put our trust uh, in Allah beyond that. And then, and, and hopefully that will help us work together more uh, in a more effective way. I have to say also, I was very, very proud as a Muslim, as an American Muslim, when I saw Keith Ellison speak yesterday. I was, that was one of the 
the proudest moments I think we as an American Muslim community can have and may Allah bless him and continue to give him strength to, to, to work. You know, what he said to us was very interesting uh, a couple of years ago. He said, he's getting more done as a state official than he ever got done as a congressman. And so for all you young people who are thinking about running for office, you wanna be congressman or congresswoman or a senator or this or that, uh, think about local and state uh, uh, public service first because you can make a lot more impact with our police, with our schools, with, uh, with so many uh, other important agencies. That is where the real work is needed. So, so please keep that in mind when you're talking to those who wanna run for public office. Thank you. I, wow, I feel like you guys touched on a lot of my questions already, um, but at the same time, I'm like bursting with like more questions and kind of just wanna ask them all in one go. Um, but I, I think for me right now, I, I was going through my questions and I was like rearranging as you guys were talking and there is, for me, I'm struggling to find like the balance, right? Where this has come up several times in the conversation already where, um, Fario, you, you said this is a generational fight, right? Salam also, you touched upon this and, and Islamically how God is training us to, to be actively patient. How can we find supper? And, and this is Ramadan that we're ta talking about. So how can we find supper and actively build the momentum that we've built over all these years to ensure that we can get swifter justice, um, to ensure that we can reduce police brutality and to ensure that we can fight systemic racism? You know, this will be short, but inshallah, sweet. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, pray and do. So, you know, as we're praying and we're, you know, having taco, we need to, like Brother Salam said, take action, you know. And it was such a proud moment again when Keith Ellison, you know, led that prosecution team as the Minnesota Attorney General, I mean, Minneapolis Attorney General. It was amazing. So, you know, we have to be more active. We have to, you know, grow our own, our homegrown young Muslims, let them know that, yes, it's good to protest, but the best activism is through running for offices. We need more Congress. We need senators. You know, think about the amount of Muslim senators that we have. Think about the amount of Black senators that we have. Like, just go down the list. You know, so we need to really be intentional. Think about the judges. You know, you can't become a judge unless you're a lawyer. So we need to think about that. The superintendents that run the school districts, you know, right. so let's be intentional and, and let's support our young people. Not all of us are going to be doctors. Yep. <laughs> judges, that's so critical. Getting in the courts and being the judges. That, that is an excellent point. Superintendents of schools. That's how that's how we work. That's that's how we 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 think the uh, of the long term while we're dealing with these cases. Um, but that's an excellent point. Cannot be uh, uh, stated enough. Yeah. Um, also, for the audience members, the attendees that were of this webinar, start having these conversations in your com in your communities, in your congregations, at your house, um, with your neighbors those who you have open relationships with, have these conversations with them because you'll be surprised at what's, what kind of common ground can be established and we keep building the force going forward. As a community organizer, it's very necessary to build power around an issue. And sometimes we don't know what that power can look like unless we start doing one-to-ones and identifying the common interests with one another. So yes, I, this, this webinar can only go so far, but take the knowledge of this webinar into the crevices of the United States, into the, into the communities and the places where this webinar is not gonna go, to your work, into and, your and, Facebook unions, all that. And can I also tell the audience that it's time to support institutions. This, this yeah. cannot be done by individuals, it has to be done by institutions and whether you know, you want to support CARE. Um, I'm sorry, Farheel, uh, what's your organization's name? 
View, view, voice of East African women. View, voice uh, of East African women. Yes. Uh, beautiful organization. I'm going to contribute to that organization tonight, inshallah. Um, so, uh, or the African American Muslim Insight Council. We have to create institutions that will be there uh, beyond our lifetimes, that will be continuing the work consist uh, consistently and create that momentum. It can't just be, you know, we, we say hurrah, hurrah when we, we win a case and then we all cry uh, when, we, when we see, unfortunately, too many cases uh, where it doesn't uh, uh, work towards justice. It has to be institutional work. So support institutions. I think that's a very important message for our community. I want to um, add also, I've been, I've seen all both sides of the aisle, right? I've seen how we are struggling. I'm an activist on, on the street fighting and, and making sure justice has been served. But also I'm fighting on the other side on the table where are we negotiating behind the scene when it comes to legislation bills, fundings and policy in our communities. Because by the time they see we all busy on this side, they are working on the other side. So we have to make sure that we become, you, you have to be really aware of it. There's so much negotiation going behind the scene. And when we don't negotiate and we don't try to build these bridges to cross over, then they say, well, they not matter because they only fight in what they care about while they fight for the gun violence and all of that. Let's fight for how we're gonna uh, impact in these communities because they will say how much funding is gonna go, what policy they're gonna want, and that's the law. And if we're not on sitting that side of the table, are we only fighting on the streets, which is really mad at both sides. And then I'm, I'm hoping that for our communities to really support each other when it comes to these issues. It's nothing one good or one bad, because remember, Minnesota is the only state in the United States is divided government. So before it was Washington and Minnesota, but now Washington are doing good because now they have 50s of the Senate. So Minnesota have Republicans at the Senate, and the House are Democrats. So everything we pass at the Democrat, we get rejected at the Senate. Right now, there's a bill that I'm advocating for that I am spearheading is a House File 784 and then House File 723. Those are two bills, if you guys search, one of the 784 has been talked about a lot in the state of Minnesota because it's never been seen before because we're asking for everything. We're asking for funding for $157 million. And we're also asking for some language to be revisited on the policies that is having the state of Minnesota. So this is a language that right now, myself and Valerie Castile, Philanders Castile's mother, we met with the Speaker of the House Friday. We negotiated and asking her because it's only 30 days left of the legislation. So what the language is in there, they don't like it because we're asking them, you know what? This is, is a bill that is gonna do nothing but the African-American community in the state of Minnesota, right? And then when we had a, here, one of the hearings that we had a, about a month ago, one of the Republican legislator said, this bill is nothing but racist. And then I said, how do you come up with that? Because this bill is only talking about the African-American community only. What about the Asian community? What about the native community? He said, what about the Latino community? So this bill is racist. I said, sir, why don't you look at the bill? It doesn't say Latino, it doesn't say native, or it doesn't say with respect to all of those communities. This bill, it says the African-American community in the state of Minnesota. And you have to really look at the bill and you should not bring other, this is the way they do. And there was a five, no, seven yes, because it was a majority of the Democrat. So of course we get the bill passed on that day, but the, all the Republicans on the table voted again. So what I wanna urge you today, is for us to not just leave one aisle of the table, just to stay on the other side while we're fighting injustice and no peace. And that is what we should be fighting every day. But also please take the time and your own state, I don't know who, where you are, try to visit the legislature. What bills and policy are they fighting for every day they, they pass in? Because you know what? Sometimes we don't show up and they know we don't show up at the legislators. So I think um, building the bridges, negotiating and you know support the community to come together the the muslim community the black community unite and come together and fight for justice for our communities when it comes to uh, revisiting the police policies and doing a reform and then what what reforms that it is i don't know but we say let us revisit your policy maybe there's something in the trainings that you guys are, are doing that we don't know nothing about it that we need to look at it so i think we hope that we see the police um 
policy and trainings that they do and the reforms. Thank you. I'm, I, I over talked. I'm sorry about that. No, absolutely not. You did not over talk. I'm so glad you touched on that, Fario, because what you just said that that's I think that's one of the biggest takeaways from this webinar today, where we have such a laser focus on what's going on in our national legislature. And so often we forget what the importance and what the relevance is of state and local legislation. And this goes back to also what Salam pointed out that, you know, we shouldn't just aim like as young, you know, as young adults, as, as um, young professionals, we shouldn't just aim to make an impact like at the national level, you know, go in through like national Congress, but actually work to even you know, be state officials. That is where you can make an impact. And for us, for me, that what you just said, that's making me think, oh, well, I'm here working in policy. I don't even know what's going on with like specifically California legislation. So this is very much a wake up call for us. And so thank you, Fario. You absolutely did not over speak. You, you said some of the most powerful things right now. And with that, that's smoothly helps me transition into my next question. And, and I know we're kind of running short on time. We have 13 more minutes left and I do want to have a little bit of time for Q and A, um, but I'm so sorry. I'm going to be a little selfish and ask a couple more questions. Um, really quickly, what should, um, since we are on the subject of legislation, how can we address the problem of racism in law enforcement? We understand that this is a systemic issue, right? With that in mind, what should lawmakers include in any kind of expected legislation? We know that there are laws that are being produced at state level where we know that there are like laws like Justice and Policing Act, AKA the George Floyd Act that's being um, deliberated right now in Congress as we speak. So what should we expect in that kind of legislation for true impact? What kind of provisions? When it comes to law enforcement, Mm -hmm. It's going to take, for law enforcement reform to happen, it's going to take law enforcement to check itself. It's going to take the, the, uh, those good officers who we always say that exist to stand up to those officers who, because they all in the same locker room and they, and they know the jokes that's going around. It's going to take for those officers, especially the black officers who, who are being marginalized, their voices are being marginalized by those officers for being because every time a black man speak, we get, we get labeled as being aggressive. No, we're traumatized and we speak in our truth, but don't try to tell me that I'm aggressive. So it's gonna take law enforcement within law enforcement to correct law enforcement. Because I know here in Los Angeles, we got a lot of follow-up with LAPD. And, but at the same time, we need some of those LAPD officers within law enforcement who believe um, that racism exists within their ranks to start speaking up to those officers who are racist or who are even um, a problem. The chiefs, you know, the unions, they have to start self-correcting themselves because it's, gonna, it's hard to correct it from the outside. So those on the inside have to form support groups to check the other groups within their own ranks. So, and then with our C4s, because you know we got enough 501c3s with our C4s who had who got power to political action. We could start endorsing our own candidates, start endorsing our own people to take office, like you said, the judges and things like that. But we have to make that connection and stop marginalizing people saying that you are angry voice. Listen to that voice, listen to the pain that he's speaking, because if there is a good officer and you keep muffling his voice because he's tired of getting mistreated inside law enforcement, then that's the problem. Thank you, Brother Omar. Um, Sister Katrina, what are your thoughts? Thank you, Sister Prima. Um, you know, and I think, thank you, Brother Umar, for that. And, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, when it comes to policing, and it, it, was, it was startling or mind-boggling to hear this from our youth, you know, but we need to spend more time with our youth. And I believe I saw in the comments or in the chats, you know, Imam Taha Hassan has said, we need to, you know, train our youth in activism, right? From an early age, but 
this young woman who's a junior or senior, she said, and she was Latina. She wasn't even African-American. She said, you know, when it comes to policing, we have to look at the history of policing and his, the history of policing started in, she, she likened, it, likened it to slave catchers. I was like, wow, you know, I didn't even go that deep. You know, I would always say that I compare our current policing, especially when we look at places like, you know, Chicago, where my relatives are from in New York, the policing that occurs in Philly, Chicago, and New York is completely different from the policing that happens in, you know, California. We have generations of police officers who are, you know, not to be discriminatory, and may I, Allah forgive me if I am being, but who are of Irish and Italian descent. And when we look at history and we look at, you know, we talk about white supremacy, a term that I really disdain because it empowers, it still empowers white people. You're saying that they're supreme. I mean, it's just annoying, but let me not go, to, you know, to, into a rabbit hole. When we're looking at police officers, generations of Italian and Irish police officers who historically have been sharecroppers and are now being police officers. There's a, a systemic, we talk about systemic racism, there's a disdain, a hate for certain communities, in particular Black people. So yeah, we can say our Black officers have to step up, but what's the percentage of Black officers? I know Black officers personally who have stepped up and who have been pushed out of the police department because some police departments are like gangs. And if you step up too much, regardless of your race, they will push you out. I listened to another officer down here in, in the San Diego area talk about when he was policing in Texas. He said there was a white officer who did just what you said, Brother Umar, he stepped up. He stepped up and they pushed him out. He's an Uber driver now. He's not even, he may not be an Uber driver, I'm being you know, dramatic, but they pushed him out of the police department. So it's going to take almost a defunding or a restructuring, internal and external, to help improve police departments in the United States. And we're also gonna have to have community relations that have more community departments. And when we're talking about growing our own teachers, we need to grow our own officers as well. One or two officers that are black cannot do it by themselves. We have to have a large percentage of officers. And let's be honest, as you all say, as Impact says, not all skin folk are kin folk. So that's another thing that we need to deal with. So when we're doing this, we need to make sure that we're recruiting the right culturally responsive people who are going to do the job, not just for our community, but for all. This now that it's not going to change. Change it has to come from within us. You know, we have to revisit every city, every state has their own policies and they have their legislations. If you go recruit your own community members, come together and, and see what you guys are want to change. When a traffic stop is a, is a, is a reason uh, a white supremacy can pull up a bl black man who's driving to say, oh, maybe the light tail was broken or the driver license was probably expired and bam, and it kills you right there. So this is a, is, is a long way to go, but I think we, I hope that people think big, not stay in the city and the state level, but reach out to the United States of President. He have the final to say, and maybe as a legislation, if he will support and to revisit this systematic racism, this country has been around for many, many, many years. How can he change? How can we revisit the policy that is in there that has been put in for many years ago? And I think if you're the state, right now, the state of Minnesota, there's a several bills are moving along and having hearings. And, and, and I'm proud of a couple of them are really being considered all the way in. But the Senate, we're having a hard time because the Republicans are refusing to even to give us a hearing. So I'm thinking, my sister, if you just go higher level and reach out to and then the Washington level, which is the, the president, and visit, revisit 
the policy that existed in this country uh, around the policing and many other issues that uh, we deal with for daily, especially the immigrant communities, the Muslim communities, all this anti-racism and Islamophobia and all of this that exists in this country. So I think that's, let's just go higher. Don't let's just stay in the, in the community level. Yes, I see, and thank you, sister. And I see Brother Salam is unmuted, but I wanna say something after Brother Salam, if that's okay. No, no, you go ahead. Thank you, Brother Salam. I, you, Alhamdulillah, I, re, I have appreciated everything that has been said today, but I do want us, before we get off this call, to understand when we're talking about historical, we, and alhamdulillah, I'm so glad that, you know, Sister, your community is doing some great work and working together, but we know that historically in the United States, when it comes to Blacks and when it comes to Muslims, there is still a negative stigma against African-American Muslims. In our African Muslim community, in our non-Black Muslim community, and it is not until a Somali child or a Pakistani child or an Indian child gets pulled over or gets harassed at school that alhamdulillah, we're now all on the same page. We have to get rid of this mentality and thinking. So regardless if we go all the way up to Washington or if we start at the local or state level, as an ummah, when we're talking about building bridges, we have to come together and know one another. I saw someone in the chat say, how can we come together like AAPI? We have to stop looking at each other as silos. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an African-American issue. Oh, right. that's an Arab issue. Right. That's a this issue or that issue. We are Muslims. The Quran says that. When we die, Allah's not going to ask us, what color are you? Who is this man to your right? Your deeds are going to speak out for you. So until we do that, we can go all the way up, no pun intended, to the moon. We're going to still have issues. So let's be it this day during the month of mercy, come together collectively as Muslims and be strategic. Look at who joins Sister Fario. Ask her, no matter what, what, what state you're in, Sister, what are you doing? What organizations are you working with? Ask Impact. Impact is a guidance. You know, email Brother Salam. There's so many of us that are doing. So until we come together, though, we are not going to make any difference. We're going to be fighting by ourselves. A lot more change the condition of a people to they change the condition in their heart. Mm hmm. And also the Quran says the, uh, the, uh, those who deny the truth, they are banding together. And unless you do likewise, if you do not band together, then oppression and corruption will continue to spread. Mm. So thank you, Katrina, for that reminder. So my final question, um, Sister Fario, is for you, um, because I believe right now, even geographically, you are the closest to the epicenter of, of the subject um, of today's panel. So how has the Muslim community in Minnesota been throughout this entire turmoil? We have been dealing with it for nearly a year now and then farther back if we're talking historically, but how has the Muslim community been doing in Minnesota? Ooh, we are all one here. We are fighting together. We are showing our black African-American community here in Minnesota that we are no different than you. We are Africans, we are Muslims, we are here. We are gonna to fight together. We're gonna to go all the way in. We have been protesting, we've been on the streets. If you, I mean, you've seen it. I mean, the, the Muslim community is more than ever engaged here in the state of Minnesota, not only Somali. I know we see a lot of Somalis is out everywhere, but um, we are seeing a lot of Muslim communities, the different communities where the, Asian, when I mean Asian, is like the Pakistani, Afghanistan, and, and Middle Easterns. I think I have a lot of brothers and, student, and sisters in the Middle Eastern community who also are stepping up to run for offices because they see, I, I think there's a sister now, um, I don't know if she's Afghanistan or Middle Eastern, she's running for a city council here in Minneapolis. I think we are engaged. Our Muslim community are feeling that struggle that our black, black African-American has been dealing with this for years, but now they're not alone anymore. 
uh, because we are together, we are going to be fighting, we're going to be loving each other, we're going to heal each other. Um, I'm part of a group now called Unity Community Mediation Team. So what we do is we, we visit different communities, but the Muslim community, as I'm one of them, as a Muslim immigrant, as a black woman, I think this is something that I've been excited about for, for years. And I've been enjoying it and I've been volunteering my time. All of this work is nobody gets paid for it. It's a volunteer work because we, we care about the community because if we don't protect the community, because this white community who are coming in in our communities, we tell them, we don't hate you guys. We're grateful you let us in here, but this is not your land. This is the neighbor's nativist land, right? But we let's come here together and be our one Minnesotans. That's what we say. The word is one Minnesotans. Let's come together, let's unite white, black, Muslims, everybody coming. So I'm just grateful to see that our Muslim community are not holding back, coming forward and, and, and showing all this love and support. And this Ramadan, every corner in the streets, if you pass, the churches, everybody's putting a sign says it's a blessed Ramadan, right? So now more than ever, because of our very heavily um, um, persistent of we wanna be part of the Minnesota community that has been felt by the white community. So that means the Muslim community are not slowing down. We get them better and bigger. And if they don't like it or not, we are here, we're not going anywhere. So I'll just let you know that I'm excited about when you ask that question. Thank you. There is hope. There is hope. I think that's the message uh, from today from everybody here. And just being with everybody makes me hopeful. So I really appreciate all the work uh, of these great people. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, and I always say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. This is great, and I am always grateful. And my gratitude is people like you and many out there who are fighting for justice. And it just hurts my heart to see another human being hates another human because of the color of their skin or the religion they belong to. Yes. Mashallah. I just want to say, Alhamdulillah. I'm I'm grateful. I'm I'm. Mashallah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and with that, we are. At conclusion, in fact, we're three minutes over, but I think that we we needed those those extra minutes. Um, this has been an incredibly important conversation, and you know, I, one of the themes of this has been that the fight is ongoing. So I envision us having further conversations like this, and so and inshallah with with more and more positive news. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Brother Umar, thank you so much. Sister Fario, thank you so much. Sister Katrina, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With Allah, we, everything's possible. Yes, and can we end with uh, Surah Al-Asr? Wal Asr inna insan illa ladina am. No, go ahead. Yeah, let's do it together. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm reading with no, you. No. Sorry about that. Sorry about no, that. No, I want to, I, I, I think, no, you're right. Go let's ahead. do it. Go ahead, go. No, let's I'll do wait. it together. Go. Let's do it together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr inna insan illa ladina amin wa amin al-salihat wa asab al-haq wa asab al-sab. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, by the token of time, surely people are at a loss, except those who attain to faith and those who do good work. And they practice together perseverance and patience, and they practice together working for the truth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Alaikum salam.